not. Um, generally, the breakthroughs do break down by time and age. So you're seeing it more pronounced in older individuals who were vaccinated a while ago. That doesn't mean that there aren't exceptions. What we think is happening is that Delta creates such high viral loads early in the course of the illness that if you have declining levels of circulating antibodies, it can overwhelm your initial defenses. It can overwhelm those circulating antibodies. You get infected, and then you're dependent upon secondary immune cells. You and I have talked about, like memory B cells and T cells, to kick in to then fight that infection to prevent you from getting sick from the infection, but it takes a couple of days for those secondary immune cells to kick in. So in the meantime, you've been infected, you might be developing mild symptoms, eventually those immune cells will kick in and those, will, those cells will prevent you from developing severe disease, from being hospitalized, but you'll qualify as someone who's become infected with COVID at that point. So this is really the debate among the public health crowd, because what they say is maybe we don't need boosters because the vaccines are still doing their job in terms of protecting people from getting hospitalized and developing severe disease. The premise never was that they were going to prevent all infections. We just took for granted that the early data showed that the vaccines were very effective at preventing infections. But I think the, the reality is and the concern is that if you see rising infections among people, particularly among more vulnerable people, eventually that's going to start to translate into worsening outcomes among those individuals. And that's the argument for boosters. Well, and if you can, you know, if vaccinated people can give it to one another, then you finally find someone who's unvaccinated who doesn't have the worst case scenario, take it off the table. So, you know, that's that's not a good outcome. You also uh, we were uh, not on camera, but you, you updated me on a on another study in this case that showed that uh, that vaccine immunity was at least as good or maybe better than natural immunity. So you've got one study that, that, that seemed to indicate something else and another one that seems to indicate what you've said all along was that isolating the spike protein might give you an even a more robust uh, immune response uh, than, than natural immunity. Right. This Right. This was a study out of the UK. It was actually well done. It was a better constructed study than the Israeli study that seemed to suggest that natural immunity was more robust than vaccine induced immunity because the study out of the UK was a perspective study. They followed people prospectively and it showed the opposite. Um, I don't think that we should draw any single conclusion from any one of these studies. I don't present the study as sort of a dueling study to say one's right, one's wrong. I think on the balance, it's unclear whether vaccine-induced immunity is better, slightly better, slightly worse than vaccine-induced immunity. The reality is vaccine-induced immunity can be redosed, so immunity is going to decline over time in both individuals. So you can redose a vaccine. You don't want to redose an infection. And to acquire a vaccine in uh, infection-induced immunity, you have to actually get the infection, which is something that we want people to try to actively avoid. So getting a vaccine has a lot of elegant attributes in that regard. But I do think that these studies... Um, lead to a different conclusion, which is that the immunity conferred by natural infection seems to be robust and seems to be durable. We know it lasts at least six months, probably longer. We don't know how the severity of the infection you get correlates with the robustness of the immunity that you're going to acquire. With SARS and MERS, we saw that people who got more sick um, ended up having more durable immunity. We don't know if that's the case with this SARS-CoV-2 virus, but it might be. So we don't understand a lot about the um, how long the immunity is going to last with respect to people who get infected. My hunch is it's not going to last in perpetuity. At some point, those individuals will need to be vaccinated. But it certainly lasts a period of time. And in Israel, in fact, with their green pass, in order to qualify to get a green pass, you have to demonstrate that you've been vaccinated. But you can also demonstrate that you've been recently infected because they're recognizing that there's a period of immunity that's quite robust after infection that confers equivalent protection um, to, to vaccination or semi-equivalent protection to vaccination that it should be recognized for those policy purposes. Now, again, they have the equivalent of a vaccine vaccine passport or an immunity passport in Israel, which is something that I think a lot of people who are proponents of uh, acquiring immunity naturally and foregoing vaccina vaccinations would probably be again. So I'm not sure how we'd account for that, but there are a sizable number of people, as you know, arguing that we should be recognizing um, acquired immunity. Hey, Scott, uh, just in terms of Meg's report, uh, the FDA, you obviously know the organization well. Are you concerned about these two people leaving the vaccine program? Well, look, I think it's unfortunate. These were two very experienced hands at the agency. They were going to retire at some point. They had been there a, a long time, as Meg said. I hope that they would put off their retirement for many years and stay on the agency. And it's unfortunate to see both of them retired uh, about around the same time later this fall. There's a deep bench in that group, but I do think that this evidences some frustration that's coursing through the agency. 
um, particularly with CDC and the way CDC has been encroaching on FDA's regulatory affairs, and that hasn't been disciplined. I mean, this is really the job of the HHS secretary to make sure the operating divisions are staying in their lanes. And we've seen CDC repeatedly encroach on regulatory issues that are the, the domain of the FDA. And my, my criticism of the CDC is they're not really doing their day job. They're not doing the CDC's job, even as they're trying to do the FDA's job. With respect to boosters and, and so-called White House interference, um, I'm hard-pressed to really see that here. The White House, if anything, I think the fault of the White House has been that they haven't taken a real hands-on approach with these agencies, particularly with CDC, and directed some of their activities. I think that the White House has taken a posture that they're not going to be directing these agencies whatsoever, and that's sort of a reaction that they've adopted out of their perception that the Trump White House did interfere with these agencies, so the Biden White House wanted to, you know, revert to the opposite extreme. And I do think that they should be intervening more, quite frankly, particularly with respect to CDC to prod CDC along on some of the things that that agency ought to be doing. But I, I'm hard-pressed to see where the White House has been intervening here. The issue of the boosters was a decision made by effectively a council of the leaders of the different agencies, including FDA. Mm -hmm. And my, pres my presumption is the reason they had to go out and do that and say that they were sort of backing into the September time frame is you need to prep that. You can't just wait until the date that the agency makes a decision that it's going to authorize boosters and say, we're going to get started now. There's a lot of logistical planning. It takes months, really, to get that operational. So they need to start operationalizing that now in anticipation that the regulatory agencies may make that decision. And in fact, the FDA's leadership was involved in uh, the ultimate recommendation that was put out or the soft recommendation that was put out. All right. That makes sense. But what's the CDC doing to interfere? I mean, we, we did see that when it comes to, you know, doctors prescribing off label uh, the vaccine for kids ages five to 12, the CDC was pretty strict and pretty threatening when it came to doctors. What are they doing to mess with the FDA? Well, I think, I think a lot of this was most pronounced around the adjudication of the um, issues around the J&J &J vaccine, where you saw this, the CDC step in front of the FDA and start publicly adjudicating an issue of vaccine safety that would normally be a determination that FDA would make. And they didn't even give FDA time to do a thorough investigation, reach a conclusion, and issue it publicly before they basically usurped that process in a very public way. Um, you need to respect those regulatory boundaries. FDA needs to have time to adjudicate and investigate issues of vaccine safety and vaccine efficacy, reach a determination, make a conclusion, issue it publicly before CDC is convening panels and issuing public conclusions about issues of vaccine safety. So they acted as a de facto drug safety or vaccine safety regulator in that instance. I don't think they stayed in their lane. They certainly didn't work in what was I perceived as a cooperative fashion with the agency. But it's been in other instances as well where CDC has been issuing public proclamations that effectively revise the labeling on the vaccines before FDA has a time, has a chance to adjudicate the science and reach an independent conclusion. So they're functioning as a vaccine regulator when really they're, what they should be doing is providing advice to physicians on how to properly use vaccines within the context of the conclusions reached by the FDA. That's historically CDC's job. They issue advice to medical practice and medical practitioners interpreting um, regulatory determinations and issuing practice guidelines. They've gone well beyond that. Scott, thank you for helping us understand. Good to see you. Thanks.